Society. Today's event is entitled Mali and the Scramble for Africa. Two days into the Mali intervention, French airstrikes killed many civilians in an already volatile region, which begs the question, is France's intervention in Mali part of a growing scramble for Africa? Mali occu um, France occupied Mali as a colony until 1960. Mali was at the centre of a historic colonial empire and is now at the heart of its effort to control a mineral-rich area. 80% of France's energy output is nuclear energy, and Mali is very high in uranium, amongst other minerals. The British government have been very quick to support the French intervention without, <clears throat> without a democratic discussion or debate, showing how keen the government is to participate in a new rush for influence in the African continent. The British government has backed the intervention without several hundred with several hundred military personnel and planes. It is extraordinary that the British government have not learnt from the terrible legacy of Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya. Thank you for joining Burbeck Stop the War to discuss these issues. Our speak first speaker today is Explo Nani Kofi, the, the director of the Colombo Centre in London anti-war campaigner and writer specialising in neo-colonialism in Africa for which he was held in military detention in his home country of Ghana before escaping exile of 27 years in the Slovak Republic and United Kingdom. Thank you. Um, brothers and sisters, um, I'm very happy to be with you here where we can have a discussion about what is happening in Africa at present. Um, what's happening in Africa at present? We can look at it in two parts. One is the extension of the area of uh, the war on terror. Uh, the second one is the widening of the um, an attempt to uh, deep in the control of the Western countries of the resources of the African continent. Um, the, after the Second World War, the um, North American countries had got involved with the earlier colonial authorities who divided uh, the African continent during the Berlin Conference. So I always put it that what's happened is that the North American countries, the uh, USA, and uh, recently Canada, which didn't used to be a belligerent force among the um, Western countries, also got involved and actually deeply involved in the case of Mali in particular. And um, I say that the way that the countries in Africa were created, partly at the bottom of what is happening in Mali today, and also the attempts by the Western countries, the North American or European countries, to uh, control the resources or to um, ensure that they do not lose the resources that they have been controlling. And the threats from China seem to have uh, also turned that side in uh, getting the Cold War uh, coming back in another form, in the form of a trade war. Uh, in, I think it was October 2006 that uh, the Chinese met uh, 50 heads of state from Africa and had an uh, agreement on widening economic cooperation. By uh, the first quarter of 2007, the instructions for setting up Africa had come. So you can see that even the period in which uh, they met, the competition is already very visible that AFRICOM and Chinese cooperation are coming up around the same time. And today, uh, AFRICOM, the US uh, African Command, is in uh, 34 countries in Africa. Uh, to the way in which the countries were created, um, in uh, northern Mali, um, Arabs, Tuaregs, Songhai, Pels, Bozo. Some, some people think that the <coughs> North Mali is only made up of Tuareg. 
and uh, we have to uh, make sure that that, in, that point is very, very clear. North Mali is not made up of only Tuareg. And actually, the Tuareg question is a question limited to the boundaries of Mali. And uh, even at independence, as uh, Victoria Britain was drawing people's attention last time, the Tuaregs were still keeping some slaves, uh, of, uh, of people of, um, who originated from the Nile Valley, uh, Niger Valley, sorry. And uh, Modibo Keita had to um, influence them to uh, bring to an end uh, that uh, uh, enslavement. And that around the 18th and 19th centuries, the Tuaregs and the Arabs had raided what is today southern Mali for uh, slaves. So there was a kind of uneasy relationship between the people who are in today's South Mali and the people who are in today's North Mali at a time of independence. So that's why the Tuaregs requested from the Gaul that they should have their own country at a time of independence. Uh, and uh, the French didn't do that. But what they did was to divide the Tuaregs among um, Libya, Algeria, Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. The other thing about uh, which also uh, contributes to, to, to the uh, historical background to today's crisis is the colonial interference in the affairs of African countries, and specifically in the case of Mali, when uh, they had independent, uh, President Modibo Keita was one of the progressive presidents in Africa, and he immediately pulled Mali out of the French community and deepened cooperation with uh, Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. That in itself created problems with the French because the French felt that that would mean that they would be losing control over Mali's politics and over its resources. So um, they started the plot from there. But um, Modibo Keita, together with other heads of state and other movements, um, were involved in organizing the All Africa People's Conferences. The All Africa People's Conferences. First in Accra, Ghana, 1958, Tunisia, 1960, uh, 1961 in uh, Cairo, Egypt. And uh, at the conference in Cairo, Egypt, adopted a resolution on neocolonialism and took a decision that there was going to be a meeting to uh, strategize on how to fight neocolonialism collectively. And uh, it was decided that the next conference would be in Bamako, Mali, where Modi Moketa was the president. The first Tuareg rebellion happened in 1962. Between um, the, uh, the time of the conference which adopted the resolution of neocolonialism and when the scheduled conference in Bamako took place, and uh, that will clearly show you the um, the way in which the Western countries, former colonies, were worried about this whole uh, resolution of neocolonialism and the effort to fight neocolonialism. So the um, uh, the conference didn't come on in 1964. And 1967, Modibo Kepita took Mali back to the French community and toned down his relationship with Eastern Europe and brought in the IMF and the World Bank. That was not enough for the West. The following year, he was kicked out under French influence. Moussa Terori uh, overthrew uh, um, Modibo Kepita. And around that period, Various heads of state who were linked with the All African People's Conferences, Nkrumah, who had initiated a conference, he was overthrown by uh, what is now known as a CIA uh, paid and influence coup in 1966, Modibo Keita 1968. And so the whole process of Western countries trying to control the resources of the African continent has been on the way since um, independence, uh, after independence. Uh, when people even tell me that they're, they're trying to go in for more resources, the question I normally ask is, did they ever go away? Um, the fact is that they never went away. The foreign companies, the multinationals which control the resources, those who are involved in the mining industry and all these things, are the Western countries. So they have never gone away. They've actually widened their involvement. Uh, Africom now provides the military machinery for the control and looting of these resources. and. Um, when people even say that America is laid back in this, I always ask people, if they are in 34 African countries, how can you say that they are laid back? Because what, we have 54 countries. When the African Union you know, meets, 34 votes will be majority. And so clearly, the continent itself is under occupation in a way that is ensuring that the resources of the continent, the resources of these countries can be taken, the minerals of these countries can be taken. And 
I'll say that if you see the way in which the Chinese um, alliance uh, relationship with um, the African countries for trade improve, deepening trade relations happens at the same time as AFRICOM is also set up. You see, so it is very clear that there is a situation in which these various forces are all trying to compete for their resources and the Western countries try to make sure that the resources that they have, they can keep hold on. The last point I'll make here, I'm, not, I'm going to be told that my time is up, but the last point I, I'll make here is the one about the supposed terrorist groups which the Western countries are supposed to uh, be uh, going in to stop. The Akeda, which is the mother organization of Akeda in uh, the Islamic Maghreb, itself emerged as a result of the Western countries attempt uh, their uh, proxy war against uh, the Soviet presence in Afghanistan. That's how they armed these forces and created the conditions which led to the emergence of Al Qaeda. Many of the, some of the people who were involved in the Islamic militant movement in uh, West Africa, Northwest Africa, were trained in uh, Afghanistan. And uh, the, in 1991, when the Islamic Front won the election in uh, Algeria, the Western Council claimed they are for elections, they are for democracy. You will imagine that if anybody wins elections, they'll be allowed to rule. But the military regime uh, called the elections, canceled the elections because the Islamic uh, fundamentalists had won. And they decided to try to destroy the front by infiltrating uh, uh, intelligence services into into these groups and then creating all manner of other uh, rival uh, Islamic groups. As a result of this, the uh, groups like the Salafis, the, um, the Akim, uh, Akeda in the Islamic Maghreb emerge. And you see, the funny thing is that when you look at the Libya Islamic Fighting Group, this Libya Islamic Fighting Group it comes from this same category. They were assisted and supported by the West in fighting Gaddafi, in overthrowing Gaddafi. And some of these people are Tuaregs who come from northern Mali. They supported them as the Islam, uh, uh, Libya Islamic fighting group. They go back home as Ansadin or Mujao, and then you claim that you are chasing them now. Yeah, you see, the duplicity of the West here is so clear that in this case, it is not only saying that they are supporting the likes of some people somewhere and not supporting their likes elsewhere. But the same human beings who fought in the Libra Islamic fighting group just going southwards and you said that after arming them, after giving them money to fight in Libya, you are going after them. The same human beings, not that we are saying they are like, but the same fiscal beings like our Gali and uh, who is the leader of the Assad, they were the same people who were the Libra Islamic fighting group fighting in uh, uh, in Libya, supported by the Western countries. The fact is that the Western countries, France in particular, have been involved in looting uh, livestock and other um, property of um, people in northern Mali during the time that they attacked. And that if they had been involved in the past in looting, in, in looting these resources, how can they now come there to protect and it's because they have a track record of having done the same thing that they are coming to stop. Um, my time is up, and I'll say, uh, yeah, during question time we will continue, but the world that we live in was not always like this. It was shaped this way by human beings. And it's human beings again can change it, and that's the task of you and I. Thank you. Our next speaker today is Fiona Edwards, newly appointed National Student Representative of Stop the Wall Coalition. Fiona is an enthusiastic activist who is heavily involved in the movement on university campuses and national demonstration, and a Burbank student. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today, and it's um, a real ple pleasure to be um, sharing the platform with Explo and um, Chris Lynham as well. Um, I think. Uh, uh, just following on from what Ekman said, which I thought was an absolutely brilliant speech in terms of what's going on in Africa. Um, this week, um, Germany announced that it's planning to send 330 troops um, to Mali in order to help 
um, the France's military operations there. Um, they will be joining, um, obviously, the French army and 300 British troops, which are also on their way. Um, so it's clear, in this situation, European imperialism, um, in the form of mainly France, but also supported by Germany um, and Britain, is attempting to establish colonial control in Mali in order to get its resources. Um, it's not about human rights. These, are the, these countries have been you know, responsible for um, colonising um, Africa. Um, in recent period, the record of Britain um, in the Middle East shouldn't need to be, uh, be reminded of, you know, killing a million people in Iraq, hundreds of thousands in Afghanistan. It's not about democracy either, um, and it's not about combating um, terrorism, as the last speaker just um, went through. Um, I think it's important to note that um, in the whole of uh, Saharan Africa, imperialism is really stepping up its intervention. So, you know, the United States obviously has got this AFRICOM, which is a pro-US um, pro pro military forces. Um, and they've got various military operations across Africa. They're increasing um, their, drone, their drone interventions. They've got, they're building a drone base now in, in Niger. That's just been announced earlier in the, in the week. Um, and we know what, you know what drones are doing to you know, people in um, Pakistan and, and what devastation they can cause. Um, France, um, they recently had a war on Côte d'Ivoire, um, in addition to the war that they're now waging on Mali. In Britain, um, we've got something to look forward to here. David Cameron has promised us a decade of war on Africa. That's the speech he's made, 2013, a lovely way to start the year. Not, you know, this is where it's going to focus, obviously, supporting France in, in Mali, but also, you know, Somalia, South Sudan, like, these are the targets um, of British imperialism. So I just want to sort of ask the question, why is... Um, imperialism um, in, in US form, European imperialism. Why are these? Why is the West in, increasing its intervention in Africa? Well, I think in, in recent years, what we've seen is African <coughs> nations have sought to diversify their economies um, by increasing trade with other partners in the global South, so be that China or Latin America. Um, and this has resulted in African countries dragging themselves out of poverty, poverty which was inflicted. You know, by new, you know, new neoliberalism, the World Bank, IMF, um, etc. And this is totally intolerable to the West, to the United States and the rest of the West, who want to preserve and, re and restore their domination of African economies through the World Bank and the IMF. Um, and this is what is lying behind imperialism increased intervention in Africa. And there's a division of labour taking place um, with the former um, colonial masters. Um, France and Britain in particular playing a leading role, but the United States has totally got a lot of interest in this region as well. Um, so what imperialism represents basically is a threat to the progress um, that African countries have achieved in terms of diversifying their economy and trying to grow their economies, economies and bring people out of poverty. And, and the West has got nothing to offer African um, people in Africa at all. I mean, the history should speak for itself, you know, colonialism, the neo-colonialism, you know, neoliberalism, which just doesn't, which does not provide a way forward for pe for the people in Africa at all, and has been responsible for historically, uh, economically underdeveloping um, that continent. Um, so, in terms of trying to get a sense of what imperialism is up to, I think it is important also just to widen our um, uh, widen our outlook into what's happening also in North Africa and the Middle East as well. I think it kind of gives us a lot of indication of what's going on in, in Mali. So two years ago, um, in Li um, the West bombed, um, waged war on Libya for regime change. Now, the reason for this was basically Gaddafi um, was, was working independently of imperialism, which was totally intolerable. They wanted a complete client regime there. Um, you know, so, so what they did was send hundreds of thousands of bombs, killed 30,000 people, the country is in total chaos, there is no democracy, there are racist lynchings, you know, the, the human rights are just taking a huge step backwards, and that is the result of Western intervention in, in Libya. Um, and the, the situation is, is still very, very unstable. Um, you know, and as a result, France got 30% of the contra oil contracts in Libya, because it's obviously a very um, oil-rich rich nation. So that's, the, you know, that's what we did to help the Libyan people, you know, destroy the country, steal the oil. Um, in Syria, um, there may have been quite a bit of confusion um, when the fighting started a couple of years ago. I think now it's absolutely clear what is going on. I think 
who you've got an alliance with the United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Britain, France, with some people that describe themselves as rebels all in an alliance together. And the purpose of this intervention, again, is not democracy, is not human rights. The purpose is to overthrow that regime, um, which operates, again, independently of imperialism. It's not tolerable that you know, Syria supports Hezbollah when in, in the fight against is, um, Israel. It's not tolerable that uh, Syria supported the resistance in Iraq against the US um, war. It's not tolerable that Syria is opposed to war on Iran. And so for this reason, they would like someone even, you know, even more um, in, a, in alliance, even more in alliance with imperialism, someone totally client, client regime. So that's, that's their goal, which is you know, regime change, which is illegal under international law. So that's what's going on in Syria. Um, and I think it's important to sort of just look at overall what, what else is happening in the Middle East, um, because it's a very important um, area strategically for energy. Um, so you've got um, Israel would like to bomb Iran if it can. Um, you've got the West allowing Israel to completely have a free hand in its vile oppression of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, with the siege on Gaza and continuing. And also in Egypt, um, obviously if the West have to work with the Muslim Brotherhood <coughs> government, Muslim Brotherhood government there, then they, would, they will. But they would rather something completely a lot more in alliance with them. So you know, if they can get away with doing a, you know, coup, working with the Egyptian military, uh, United States, um, Saudi Arabia, and that's what they will seek to do because you know a massive country there. They you know they don't want it to be a millimeter away from the U.S.'s interests. Um, so just returning back to Mali, the reason I've just gone through that briefly is just because I think it's important to understand that the whole region around Mali, the whole region in Africa, the Middle East, is brimming with imperialism pushing its own agenda and its own interests, particularly using military means, which is you know, increasingly on the agenda as well at the moment. So. What are the um, prospects in Mali? Well, obviously France is playing the absolute leading role there. Um, and I think we, 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 may, we, may, be, we may be seeing a, a long war, um, similar to the sort of situation in Afghanistan and you know, the br brutal uh, treatment of the population that have suffered because of that. Because the, op the opponents of, of France are doing a similar thing to what has happened in, in Afghanistan, which is you know, retreating into the desert, retreating into the hills, into a position where um, you know they can basically have a, have a have a long term war. So, I, I, you know, it, it doesn't. You know, the, the French military doesn't have anywhere near the, the capacity of the United States. And look, you know, the United States couldn't cope in um, in Afghanistan. So it looks like a long time of um, misery and, and destruction might be maybe brought on um, brought to to Mali by imperialism. And obviously, our government wants to play a role in that. Um, so just to sort of sum up, I think. France and Britain have, played, have spent centuries plundering the resources of Africa. And it should be noted that obviously often it's often portrayed in the media like you know there's, there's nothing in Africa. It's, Africa's full of resources still to this day, and that's why um, the West is so interested in it. They spent centuries plundering the resources of Africa, trying to oppress the people of Africa, and absolutely nothing has changed. That is still their goal. Um, you know, total self-interest, nothing to help the people there. And I think our responsibility um, as a Stop the War Coalition is to you know, raise attention to what is happening and, and the role that our government is playing and to build opposition, basically, and build an anti-war movement um, because, you know, what we can do to actually help the people in Mali is to get our government to stop intervening and stop oppressing the people there because you know, it's using our, our money, our taxpayers' money, to oppress the people um, in Mali, and you know, very shortly British troops will be on the ground there. Um, and you know, 300 troops at the moment. How many will it be in a year's time? You know, if it continues, how many more will will be sent? You know, as I said at the beginning, you know, today, uh, or sorry, earlier in the week, Germany announced that sending 300 troops. That sort of implies they need a lot more you know, military assistance there. So I think you know, it should be a priority for for us at Birkbeck stop the war and nationally to sort of build up movement to say, you know, no, no more war, let's learn the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Oh. Our final speaker today is Chris Nynam, one of the founding members of the Stop the War Coalition. Chris was one of the main organisers of the 15th February 2003 anti-war protest against Iraq. 
Chris has written widely on anti-war movement and his latest book is entitled The People vs. Tony Blair. Okay, um, just in case you thought that anything that the other speakers have said is kind of tendentious or a kind of partial view of things, I just want to start with a quote from the man called John Kerry, who's the Secretary of State uh, in the US, um, which, you can, which you can easily see on YouTube, um, where he says, this is like a week or two ago, China is all over Africa. I mean, all over Africa. And they are buying up long-term contracts in minerals. And you name it. And there are some places where we're not in the game. And folks, I have to say, we need to get in the game. It takes a bit of effort. Somebody was paying to back up their investment, i.e. the Chinese. And we need to get behind our own investors, and we need to push our own interests. So that's from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And uh, just a couple of other backup quotes. There's, a, there's actually a, an article in the Financial Times from last week. Investors start a new scramble for Africa. Uh, a man called Richard Gush, head of Bank of America Merrill Lynch's South Africa operations. There is a second scramble for Africa underway, he says. Um, the Sebastian Lieblick, global head of index management at MSCI, another big fund operator coming out of Europe and uh, the US. There is an increasing appetite for Africa. From African investors wanting to invest, but also international investors wanting to get increased expo exposure, he says. So, I mean, we have to recognize that, you know, this is all part of stripping away the kind of rhetoric that is being used to justify the wars, which is the rhetoric of kind of humanitarianism and democratic, you know, support for the poor, benighted people of Africa. That the very fact that there are clearly these major forces from the government, through the kind of financial elites of the Western world, who are through the financial papers of the Western world, who are kind of very, very focused on this what they regard as a, as, a, as a new and important area, uh, or, or an area that has, has a massive increasing, uh, increase of importance when it comes to trade and investment, that these forces are going to be important, shall we say, in shaping uh, kind of geopolitics and foreign policy and military policy. I mean, it's worth saying, I mean, examples have been given, but... I mean, even leaving aside those arguments for a moment, it's, um, I mean, the idea that the war being, or the intervention being run by uh, France, but supported by Britain, Belgium, now Germany, and the US, the idea that this war is being pursued for essentially humanitarian uh, purposes is, if you stand back and think about it, frankly, um, frankly absurd, laughable, really. Um, France's foreign policy, the expo talked about it, but... But, I mean, France has had since independence, since they were essentially their extremely barbaric colonial regimes in various uh, African countries were, were removed by popular pressure. France has conducted a policy that uh, it has called or nicknamed Franc Afrique. Um, Freak, by the way, is a, is a kind of argo, is a kind of um, uh, uh, slang in French for money. Um, and this policy basically has been to kind of continue colonial operations by other means. It's basically involved installing trusted and loyal politicians in their ex-colonial countries and backing them up. Very often, by the way, with interventions, I think there's been 46 French, uh, military interventions by the French in Africa uh, in the years since 1960. 46 is a rough estimate. Um, uh, but basically propping up these uh, loyal politicians by all sorts of means, by arming them, by investing, by, by giving them all sorts of uh, uh, aid and so forth, and also by supporting them militarily, in order to ensure that these countries essentially give up their, uh, their resources to, uh, to, to the French government, to French companies. So confident have they been in this system, uh, and so recently, um, that President Chirac famously said in the late 1990s, Africa is not ready for democracy. Um, because that's the kind of way that they've, uh, they've manipulated the situation, as Expo says. And indeed, I mean, it's worth saying here, despite all this talk of 
uh, of you know democracy and, and defending freedom and so forth in Mali. The Malian government is not an elected government. It was actually there was an elected government which was actually removed by a coup last year. This is something you don't get in the media at all. So so you know the idea that I mean this is without going into the bloody history of British and German and Belgian occupation in Africa running from the second half of the 19th century right through to the post-war period. So, you know, just the idea that the